Firstly, I would like to thank ARPA Institute uh, for giving me this chance to talk to you about uh, this very important uh, matter. Uh, it's an important uh, phase in our church history. And uh, studying this period would enrich anyone uh, who is inter interested both theologically, literally, and historically. And I would like also to thank especially Father, uh, uh, Dr. Hagop Panosian for uh, helping to organize uh, this event. Thank you. So, first of all, uh, let's uh, begin our lecture by asking, why Syriac? Undoubtedly, this question has risen in the minds of the important figures, theologians, translators, and cultural figures who worked during this period in 12th to 14th century Cilicia. Of course, this was not the first period that there was an interest in Syriac heritage among Armenian circles. We witnessed this already in the 5th century Armenian Renaissance in letters and learning, when the Armenian alphabet was first created by Mr. Rokmash Tots. So his first job after inventing the uh, alphabet, which was, uh, according to the historians, was in Edessa. Some say it is in Mitzvim, Nisibis, scholarly consensus varies on this issue. Later we also find this awakening uh, towards Syriac studies in the uh, civil age period of uh, 8th to 9th centuries, during the Bagratid period. Some works were translated at that period too, but I'm not going to concentrate on these works. Uh, as the uh, lecture title indicates, I will uh, concentrate myself on these periods, 12th to 14th centuries. So, uh, Syriac uh, is an offshoot, it's a branch of Aramaic, which, uh, which is a West Semitic language. Uh, it's a language that uh, assumed a literary character. It began to be used in literature starting from mid second century. We have Syriac inscriptions before that, uh, but it wasn't used as a vehicle for literary transmission. The first person who did that was Bardesa of Edessa. He is a very famous name also in Armenian uh, uh, history. Uh, Moses Horenati talks about him at length. I'm not going to uh, rest on this issue now. So, Syriac is, has its importance, not only in Armenian, but also other uh, world uh, literature, primarily uh, because it's the oldest link that can attach us to the time of uh, to the period just succeeding uh, Jesus himself. We know that portions of the Gospels were written in Aramaic and uh, traces of that are found in the Gospels. So, um, 
the Aramaic uh, which was exemplified by the Syriac uh, finds its way in the Syriac literature and it best explain, expresses the main uh, tendencies of the Aramaic speaking Christians so we find there uh, kind of models and methods that were used in earliest Christianity and uh, in the period that is uh, transferring from early Judaism to Christianity particularly rabbinic Judaism and also uh, there is uh, this uh, outpowering of rich symbolism that is peculiar to Mesopotamia and uh, Persia uh, which is very mystical as we shall see we, see, uh, we, we witness that in the writings of Saint Ephraim and the church that uh, Armenians has close contacts with were mostly the uh, Syriac uh, uh, Jacobite churches and uh, it was through this uh, throughout the centuries that uh, mostly it was the Jacobite or the Western uh, had, which had its center in Antioch that had great influence on Armenian language, literature and culture centered mostly in Edessa uh, Nisibis Amid which is today's the Arbeke. One important distinction that I have to make now is that sometimes people are really uh, confused. What is the difference between uh, Syrian and Assyrian? So, in Armenian we say Asori and that's the perfectly correct term that can describe this ethnic group why so? because the designation Assyrian belongs more to the ancient Assyria which had its center capital in Nineveh it was destroyed in 609 BC by the Persians and Medes and the Aramean which was later called they began to call themselves Syrians because uh, they wanted to distinguish themselves from the pagan Arameans uh, that had its center in Damascus we know all about around Damascus that was destroyed in 732 so the Syrian people known today as the Nestorians or the Church of the East and the Jacobites they are not related to the Assyrians although some intellectuals they try to uh, link themselves with Assyria in fact uh, the, Assyri the Syrians, or better now they call themselves Syriacs in order to distinguish themselves from the Syrians of today's day Syria which are uh, uh, mainly Muslims so uh, they are the descendants of these people who accepted Christianity in early uh, centuries having their center in Edessa but in the 5th century when they were when they have a split in theological terms part of them became Nestorian and part of them remained uh, faithful to their orthodox faith they called themselves Jacobite or the foreigners began to apply that term to them while the others began to be called Nestorian although they reject that uh, term they formed a separate church in the 
um, Persian Empire, the Nestorians, from 410. That was after the Council of uh, Seleucia, Stetsiphon. And it, uh, they, uh, they ceased to have contact with the other group of the churches, of the Syriac church, and they developed independently among themselves, having a missionary activity more to the Eastern Asia, even to uh, Mongolia, China. So uh, the Armenians, because of the doctrinal issues, has closer contact with the Jacobite Syrians or the Syrians. So that is the reason why the Armenians had very close contacts with them because they were theologically very close to us and they had uh, a positive input when Armenian literature and language has its uh, first steps during the first uh, decades of the 5th century. So in order to give you uh, an idea about uh, what's the difference between them, so you can find here, this is a Syriac script which is the oldest in the written form, and it's called Strang Strangelo. Uh, this is more uh, square type, although Strangelo itself means rounded. It's the oldest script used by the Syriac church. So at the time of Mesro Mashtots, when there were translations from the Syriac into Armenian, this was the script that was translated from. This is used uh, nowadays mostly in, uh, in headings of liturgical texts. And uh, also it is used in, in academic editions in Western universities. Prior to uh, the Armenian uh, alphabet being created, yes. services in our churches were conducted in Assyria, weren't they? Uh, yes. Because yes. people uh, didn't have something to read in Armenian. Yes. And for example, if I'm not mistaken, the word Rospome comes from uh, the Assyrian church. No, no, no. no. It, it, it's from, sorry, it's from, from Greek. Prosumes. Yes, proskune. It's proskune, to genuflate. Uh, to to genuflate. Sorry, thank you. Yes, to prostrate. Prosume, the, uh, the deacon in tongues during the liturgy said, "Let us uh, prostrate." Uh, so, uh, but there are. Uh, I, that's a wide topic. There are many words uh, derived from uh, the Syriac into Armenian. Ajaria, for example, uh, Herachia Ajaria, numbers about uh, 104. 104. Uh, mostly, let's say, liturgical terms, like uh, Kahana, Tzom, Fasting, Kahana, Preached. Uh, Shushpa, it's the linen that covers the pattern of the host. Yes, even uh, uh, commercial terms like tsarar, tsarar, envelope, uh, chanut. It's also Hebrew. It's Hebrew. Chanut is Hebrew. Chanut, chanut from them, from the uh, Syria. But they are both Semitic, like uh, Kahana is. It's dry, taken from the Syria. Taken from the Syriac. Kohen, for example, yeah. is Hebrew, but it's taken from the uh, Syriac directly. Uh, there are other words also. Uh, and uh, these uh, two are specimens from manuscripts of the uh, scripts that were used by the Syriacs. They are still in use 
mostly uh, in liturgical uh, texts. So the one on the right is Eastern, which is more closer in shape to the Estrangelo, the original one. Uh, and the other one is the Western, known as also Serta. Um, it is, uh, they call it also Jacobite, Maronite, because it is used by the Maronites in Lebanon and other parts of the Middle East. Um, this one, as I indicated, is from 8th century on. Used. But the other one uh, is also very early. Uh, they began to use different scripts, interestingly, when they split theologically. So they developed independent of each other in these matters. And they had their own uh, chair of uh, theologians, writers, historians. But the, uh, the lion's share of having uh, the most uh, famous, uh, more uh, prolific, fruitful uh, writers, theologians, are the Western uh, Syrians. And Armenians have uh, been influenced in some matters from them. And uh, the bulk of the literature that we find translated into Armenian from Syriac is from Western Syriac. So the Armenian translators could have, in the Syrian period, most likely were uh, familiar, encountered the type of the script that was used by the Western Syrians. Um, interestingly, just as a parenthesis, I would like to say that the punctuation marks for the vowel signs that are used nowadays in Arabic and also Hebrew they are taken from the Syriac. It was a Syriac influence. They began to adopt that vowel uh, uh, placement of the sounds soon after the uh, split uh, of the churches. And they wanted, of course, to preserve the uh, pronunciation of the language correctly. Because you can pronounce the same word in the Semitic language differently, depending on where you place the uh, Vowel sign. So coming to the uh, coming back. So that was a type of a, a, a introduction in uh, matters of uh, scripts, so that uh, you can have an idea what was it's like to read. Uh, Syriac uh, text at that time. Um, in the in the Syrian period, uh, we find, uh, and, uh, especially during 12th to 14th centuries, very close contacts between Armenians and uh, Syrian churches. Uh, why? Because uh, although there were Armenians before this period in uh, Cilicia, but, uh, and Syrians also, Syriacs. Uh, so I would use interchangeably these words, Syriacs or Syrian, so that you know it's about the Christian Syrians. Um, but soon after the uh, Mongol and uh, Seljuk invasions of Armenia, uh, Armenians uh, and also uh, Syrians from the more uh, northern parts of, uh, of, of Syria, Mesopotamia, they had to move to Cilicia in order to escape these uh, calamities brought by the uh, Mongol Tatar invasions. And uh, they had their, uh, so they multiplied, the, they had, uh, they established their own seas, hierarchical seas there, uh, episcopalities, even uh, uh, there were metropolitans, the Syriac church. Uh, we know that the uh, Armenians established their 
Catholic crusade in different uh, locations. You can see that in Horomkla, in uh, Zostriak, the Duk, and then in Sis. So, uh, the Sis, Sis was the final destination um, because uh, of the unsafe environment that the Armenian used to encounter in Horomkla. So, uh, there were, at this time, there were about like five uh, dioceses of Syrians in Cilicia during the Armenian Kingdom. Uh, uh, so, we find this in the following cities. is one better illustrates. This is a little bit blurry, it's a little bit blurry uh, map, unfortunately. Uh, I couldn't get a better resolution than this. So it's, uh, there were five uh, dioceses at this period in uh, Sedition Armenia, belonging to the Syrian uh, Orthodox Church. So it was in uh, Adana. You, of course, you know Adana. It's, it's here somewhere here. It's here, yes. And it was there was Marash in Marash, which is a little bit this way. Kermanikega uh, Marash, Anazarpa, which should be here. And uh, Cis, the capital Cis, and also Jehan. In the, in the 1240s, three more dioceses, Syria, were added in this part, which was uh, the diocese of uh, Kesum, uh, Rabban, and uh, Marash. Sorry, I, I mistakenly said uh, Marash in, instead of Tarsum. Should be Tarsum here. One of the five earliest dioceses, not Marash. Marash was added later. So we can see that the uh, official residence of the Patriarch. Uh, Syrian Patriarch, interestingly, was in Sis. When there were persecutions uh, and uh, there were unsafe political circumstances, they had to move their sea to Sis. And before that, uh, we know that uh, even uh, one of their famous Patriarchs, uh, Syrian, Michael the Great, used to stay in Hronkla, used to be a guest of Nerses uh, Shnora. Uh, they were contemporaneous to each other. And uh, he ruled from uh, 1166 to 1199 as a patriarch of the Syrians. And uh, we know about Nerses Shnora that he was uh, a patriarch from 1166, same year that he was enthroned. Uh, that Michael was in throne until 1173. So seven whole years. So at this time they used to have uh, close interactions with each other. And it was in Horongala, as we shall see, that many uh, works of uh, theology and literature were translated. So it was a hub center of intellectual activity. So, coming to the uh, historical relations between them, uh, the Syrians and the Armenians, the interchurch relations, we should stress that there were many uh, Syriac uh, monasteries 
that were already founded there before Armenians came, that used to be uh, used uh, equally by both Armenians and Syrians. So you can see the Armenian and uh, Syrian monks living there. These were mostly on the mountains of uh, Amanos, of, or Sevlernet, Black Mountains, as they call it sometimes in Armenian uh, historiography. So, uh, monasteries like, uh, like uh, Parlaho, which actually means a garden of God, Parlaho. Uh, we can see also the monastery of uh, Gavikant, uh, near uh, Volkswestia or Mamestia, an important center of uh, Syrian hierarchical seas. Um, we also see um, such monasteries like uh, Shuri Garmirvang, famous in Armenian history. Um, it was uh, one of the uh, main learning centers uh, of this period where uh, even Catholicoses liked to retire there in their old age. Also, monasteries at uh, Karashituvang, Karashituvang, Aregivang, and so forth. So, coming to the historical relations and uh, ecclesiastical, so we know from history, this is related by the uh, uh, famous historian Michael uh, the Great, uh, or Michael the Syrian. I talk at length about him soon. Um, that when uh, Toros, the son of Levon, was uh, was freed, actually escaped from captivity from Constantinople in 1144. Uh, the first thing he did, he walked on feet to Mopsuestia, Mamestia. And then there was this bishop of them, actually metropolitan. Metropolitan, which means he, had, he was at the head of few bishoprics. So he gave them assistance, uh, not only uh, Uh, not only in terms of uh, support, but also uh, financially. Not, more, not only morally, but financially also. Uh, he even gave him, uh, he gave him money, he gave him to buy a horse, and he gave him, according to Michael the Great, uh, one of his uh, Twelve of his men to go and uh, to conquer territory, to regain, to begin regaining his ancestral land that was deprived from. We also know that uh, for interchurch relations, Michael the Great sent, uh, sends uh, two of his bishops, learned bishops, in order to negotiate. Uh, theological issues with the Byzantines. So, uh, in these negotiations, uh, theological with the Byzantines, and also with the others, uh, Latins, uh, the Armenians or the Syrians didn't uh, negotiate independently. So they were always together, because they were of the same faith, Christological faith. Uh, there were some periods uh, that uh, we find uh, slight uh, deterioration in service between the Armenian and Syrian relations in this period. Uh, most notably in the, uh, in the end of 1180s and the beginning of 1190s, there, uh, there rose, came up a very learned Syriac uh, Vartabit, 
up there, priest named uh, Theodore Barba, who, who was later became, who became bishop, claiming the uh, patriarchal throne of the Catholic state, of the Syrian uh, patriarchate. Uh, so he found refuge among the uh, Armenians, and the uh, Armenian king uh, Grigor uh, Chorotada. They backed him uh, to become a uh, Catholicus of the Armenian Patriarch of the Syrians who were living in uh, Cilicia. This uh, unsavory atmosphere lasted for about 11 years until Theodore uh, Barbahun died and he uh, and the relations were more normalized. But we, we should admit that uh, this figure, Theodor Barbarabu, he had a very uh, important input in collaborating with the Armenian uh, scholars in the translation of Syriac literary works. Uh, we know also that in 1198, Michael the Great uh, was also present at the coronation of Prince uh, uh, Levon II as the king of Armenia, uh, king of Cilicia. Uh, he was there as a historian, uh, 13th century Gilagos Kanzageti, relates us, he says, I've made this translation from Grappa, he says, then they convened an assembly with a great multitude of commanders and chiefs and armies, nations and races, with the patriarch of the Greeks, who sat in Tarso, and the Catholics of the Syriacs, Azoris, who sat in the, that's the word he uses, who sat in the monastery of St. Barsalma, and in the confines of Melitine, and the Catholics of the Armenians with all the bishops, and they made Levon a king, and the surrounding nations brought gifts to the newly installed king, Levon. So uh, now we come to discuss the main issues, uh, the main works relating to this period. So the best example of Armenian-Syrian relations we find in the literary exchange, cultural exchange, exemplified in the translation of Syriac literary works in the Armenian. We know that this period is somehow roughly extends from 1100 to 1270. So during this period uh, there are uh, more or less very notable figures. I have chosen four of them with the uh, most uh, salient, most important contributions that they did in this field. So we first see uh, Grigor Vekayaser, uh, the second. He was from the uh, Pahlavoni family, uh, who had uh, installed Catholic Koi on the throne of the Cilician uh, see uh, for a few generations. So the most notable thing about him, about this person, is that as his name indicates, the guy has said, he, as, as we would say in English, martyr of five. So he, he liked the martyrs. So that's why he liked to collect the lives of the martyrs and the lives of the saints. He, that's why he was called uh, the Kayaser. Uh, he was a very learned person and uh, his translations are not confined only to Syriacs. Actually, he also did trans translations from uh, Greek also. So, but now I am uh, concentrating on the Syriac part 
of his translations. He uh, traveled uh, to uh, Jerusalem, Constantinople, and uh, Egypt. Very interestingly, uh, in these travels, he had the aim, uh, the objective of uh, collecting uh, writings, Greek and Syriac, about the martyrs and translate them. And we know about an incident that he uh, very shrewdly uh, managed to uh, carry out, somehow illegally, a Greek texts from Constantinople uh, that was not allowed, manuscripts. And he used to uh, tour among the black uh, mountain Amanos Lerner uh, monasteries, uh, also looking for the same type of literature. Interestingly, he went to Egypt, he found the favor with the Sultan there, and he managed to ordain a bishop for the uh, residing Armenians there. He ordained Grigor, his nephew, a bishop, to the uh, Armenians of Egypt at that time. So, uh, as we see the list, his uh, input in this area includes many words, such as uh, the Vita, the life of Evren, translated from Syriac. Also, the uh, work commentary of Daniel Astala on the Psalms. This is the longest, the widest, the most uh, profusely uh, done work in Syriac on the Psalms. It's a work by a 6th century a Syriac theologian. It's so big that it is partitioned into three parts. We know that Psalms are 151. So each 50 Psalm is separate book. And uh, it exists completely in Armenian, only in Armenian. Parts of it, uh, fragments of it, are, are also in uh, Syriac and also Arabic. Otherwise, it's completely uh, preserved in uh, Armenian, and there is a uh, uh, edition of this still uh, undergoing uh, by a monk in Echmiatin, a comparative critical edition of this work, which is a very important one for uh, Oriental, Syriac, uh, and Christian studies in general. So we see also John Chrysostom's work on the Gospel of John. Interesting, this work was first translated before him from Greek, but he found it deficient, so he ordered a new translation from the Syriac. They compared also to, with the Greek so that they can have a smooth translation. And the uh, life of Barsuma, very important saint uh, of the Syriac uh, church. Uh, later it was translated by Nerset Sonor Ali. Uh, we come the last uh, two uh, in the list, Ephraim the Syrian. As you would know, Ephraim the Syrian is a very important figure, uh, not only in the Syrian tradition, but also in the whole of the uh, Christian tradition. And he is much loved in uh, both, Arme both Syrian, Armenian uh, traditions, and also uh, Greek, Latin, Georgian, Arabic also. And uh, hardly a generation passed actually after his death because he died in 373 AD. Uh, he was born in 306, so he was about 66, 67 years old he died. That um, almost the, uh, I won't say the entire, but a bulk of his uh, literary legacy were translated into Armenian by the first translators. Although recently the research uh, reveals that uh, 
we want to ascribe, uh, we, know, we want to give a lion's share of these translations to the uh, golden era Armenian literature period, but uh, many of them were also translated during the Sedition period, as we would see. So, Ephraim the Syrian and John the Baptist and Canon of the washing of feet. Uh, these are, this belongs more to the genre of uh, uh, Madrashe Ketzurt, as we would say in Armenian. Uh, they are kind of uh, versified homily, uh, hymns. They were written to be sung, but these uh, notes were uh, later lost. Uh, so scholars now can uh, really say how were they sung, because we know Ephraim uh, that he composed these hymns in order to be sung in the church to counter those songs written by, by the son in the late second, early third century, which was very uh, predominant in the Edessa uh, church of his day. And uh, but my son was considered a heretic. So in order to uproot this heresy, uh, this or heretical tendencies from among the people, he uh, wrote these hymns. So there are about 400 hymns, actually, written by him. And uh, he is considered the most prolific, the most uh, fecund, say, scholar, uh, writer in the Syriac tradition. Uh, a historian, for example, Solomon, of the uh, 4th century, he says that he composed more than 3 million lines of text. Many of his writings survive in Armenian. So, Life of Ephraim, we have the Syriac version of it. But, uh, you know, in order to compare the beauty of the translation, you have to read the, Syri the Armenian, and if you know Syriac, you compare it with the Syriac, so you know, you can then understand that uh, the uh, Armenian translators were very meticulous. In, uh, in observing uh, both beauty of style and diction and vocabulary. I should uh, note that uh, these writings, uh, the Syriac, might have been commissioned by him or he also could have taken part in it, Grigor Vakayasir. We are not sure about him, if you knew Syriac or not. But we knew for sure that uh, this was more a collaborative kind of translation. When a Syriac scholar did a translation in, from Syriac into Armenian, or they both collaborated, and another person who was an Armenian, he revised it, he smoothened it, he made it more uh, compliant to the Armenian uh, diction and language. So here is a spe specimen of uh, one of the editions, early editions of uh, FM the Syrian's works, uh, which was uh, accomplished in Constantinople in 1767. This is a prayer of uh, Saint Ephraim. He is famous, uh, more famous among Armenians, as a, uh, as a writer of prayers. Uh, it was very widespread use among Armenians alongside the Narek. After the Narek, you can count that it was his uh, prayers that were mostly used among the Armenians. Uh, we see uh, Saint Ephraim uh, portrayed in a garb of a monk, although he wasn't a monk. I mean, he was he, he was a deacon in the church, and he had active part 
He wasn't an ascetic monk, uh, just sitting in his cell and praying. Uh, but he was also involved uh, with the people. And uh, one of the reasons that he died, actually at that age, although it's not very uh, quite advanced, 66, 67 years old for age, is that he was infected by the plague uh, uh, in Edessa while he was helping these people who fell ill. Uh, and we see he uh, bearded, uh, heavily bearded. He wasn't like that, actually. Uh, he was bald and he had scanty beard. Uh, he was short stature. Uh, sometimes you see uh, people portraying him tall person, like, uh, like domineering. He wasn't like that. So, and uh, this is another uh, page of the same work that was uh, printed in Constantinople in 1767, Prayers. And this is a, a title page and the beginning uh, uh, chapter of the uh, commentary on uh, St. John Chrysostom's were commentary on uh, uh, St. John's Gospel. So I would like to uh, read an excerpt from the life of Ephraim. I have translated from, uh, uh, from Armenian, actually, that we have it. So I'm not, of course, I'm not going to read it, to read Grappa. It's the English, so that you understand. Uh, very, it's a very interesting, actually, Vita life. Uh, where we find uh, uh, excerpts, passages there that uh, makes us reflect uh, on the philosophy of life, its value, on moral issues. He says, and as to what type of person he was going to be, about Ephraim, this is the Vita, the narrator says, God revealed with a foreboding vision, which some, like the Sinaxaria, Sinaxaria is the hagiography, say, was shown to his parents in his childhood. Why not to say that it was revealed to Ephraim himself? However, it is evident that it occurred during his adolescence, uh, when he was a teenage, because uh, we know from his hagiography that he was a mischievous uh, child and, uh, who uh, displayed also unruly behavior during his early teens, uh, which made him shamed later. And, but then he recanted, he uh, repented and uh, he mended his ways. He says, it is narrated that he himself, speaking about his own person, says, while I was being taken up from the tender age of childhood, a secret mystery happened to me, because it seemed to me that on my tongue, was born a shoot of a fruitful vine. Very interesting. Uh, a shoot of fruitful vine growing from his own tongue. And it spread so much that it filled the face of the earth. And all the birds of the heavens were coming and eating from its fruit. But the more the birds were plucking of the fruits of the shoot, the more it became full of bunches. Interesting. And then, in another passage we read, very, very interesting. Uh, then the blessed Ephraim went to the city of Amida, which is the Arbekir today. Corresponds to the Arbekir. And staying there one year, he came to Edessa, uh, which was the center of Syriac learning and literature of the time. Which is the city of Urha, of Mesopotamia, keeping in his mind to live there until the day of his death. Although he didn't live there until the day of, he had to move back to the uh, city, and then he came back, or, although later. And while entering the city, when he was at the bank of the river called Daisan, that's where the name Bar Daisan comes, because he was born, that uh, Syrian fa uh, founder of Syrian literature, while his parents were crossing the river Daisan. That's what they called him Bar Daisan, the son of Daisan. 
Then he was, then he saw women, women, who were washing clothes. And one of them was staring fixedly like this at his face for a long time. But the saint rebuked her, he scolded her and said, Don't you feel ashamed to look at me like that? And why don't you cast your eyes down? In Armenian, it says, look over the ground. Yerki. 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 Earth. She answered and said, you should cast your eyes down. Literally, look over the ground. Of which you were also taken. You are taking from ashes to ashes, as they say. Why for me it is proper to look at you? Because I was taken from you. You know, in the, the, from the Genesis story that uh, Eve was taken from one of the ribs of uh, Adam. Very interesting. When he heard this, he was astonished at the wisdom of the woman being like that of the crafty serpent. And he brought to himself, and he thought to himself, if the women of the city are so wise, how much more perfect are the men? Then he chose to dwell with some of the simple-minded in order to win them. And since he did not know any artisan profession, he joined a bathkeeper and gave himself to his service and was fed by it, and day and night he spoke the word of God to whomever he happened, whereby he threw money to the way of the Lord. So, you can appreciate this and much more when you read uh, his vita, his life, uh, and also some other words, as I should say, uh, show you. In fact, I made a purpose to uh, in order to just uh, quench the dryness of the lecture, uh, I chose some passages from different writers so that you can understand uh, why the Armenian scholars uh, wanted to translate these uh, this kind of literature and leave it to the next generation. So the next uh, writer, uh, contributor in this area that we come is the famous known, famously known Mercedes Chorach uh, Ali. He is also from the Pahlavni dynasty. Um, and uh, We find uh, among his words uh, uh, the life of Saint Sarkis and his son Argyros. We know that Saint Sarkis is a very popular saint among the Armenians. Uh, a proof of that is that there are many churches of that name and uh, many Armenians bear also that name, Sarkis. This was commissioned, actually, requested by uh, Uh, by a bishop monk, uh, Georg, from Armenia proper, Bishop of Hanbat, in the upper regions of Armenia, near the Georgian border of Hanbat. So, um, he knew that the Armenians had close contact with the Syrians, and he asked him uh, for a translation of that work from Syria into Armenian. And also we have from him the the words of Jacob of Saruk, Hagop Sarcheti. This person, Jacob of Saruk, the second most uh, prolific uh, writer in the Syriac tradition. 
after Saint Ephraim. So uh, we have it from him about uh, 700 Membras, Asatsvatsk, which were Membras are uh, homilies written in versified form. And uh, more than 250 like that were uh, published uh, of these Membras in Syria. We don't have an Armenian, actually, critical edition of his works, uh, which uh, awaits scholarship to bring it to light. Uh, uh, as St. Uh, Ephraim is known, uh, harp of the Holy Spirit in the Syriac tradition, Kanar Hokvun Serpo, so also, uh, Jacob of Sparrow is known uh, in the Syriac tradition as the flute, flute of the Holy Spirit. That's how they call him. So he is very famous, and uh, Armenians like to have a share of that uh, legacy of, uh, of uh, Jacob of Sparrow. I haven't uh, chosen any excerpt for this because I didn't find any under my possession at this time to give you a translation. But we'll see next from uh, Nerses Namboronazi how this is input. And uh, so Nerses Namboronazi, uh, who is my favorite scholar of this period, is a uh, widely uh, cultured person. He knew um, Syriac well, Latin, Greek, and Coptic. He learned Greek from his mother. From both his side, from, uh, from his paternal side, he related to the Palabunids. From his maternal side, he related to, he related to the Hetumians. King Hetums, royal family. And he was ordained uh, priest at an early age. Um, and unfortunately, he died uh, when he was hardly 45 years old uh, during the liturgy, during uh, performing uh, the liturgy, Paterak, the mass. Uh, he fell suddenly during the liturgy and he died. So he did the many translations uh, from uh, Syriac, Greek, and Latin also. We know that he translated the uh, order of the uh, uh, Benedictines. The candle of the Benedictines, the order. And uh, one of the most notable works that he did is the, uh, the Syro Roman law book which is called Asura uh, Kromiagan Dalastana Kirk. It's uh, not about uh, uh, canon law, which is uh, ecclesiastical church law, but it's about uh, law between relatives, inheritance, uh, between uh, 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 parents, sons, marriage, divorce, uh, dowry between uh, the Lord and the serf. So it's more about uh, civil law. So uh, it is assumed that there were translation before that, but uh, he made a fresh translation of it, and he also amended it, he edited it in many places. Uh, he did that with Theodor Barabahubun. That's the same person who was at this time uh, staying, residing in Horomkla, and uh, where bulk of the literary activities were going at this time, and he also helped uh, nurses translate his work. 
We know about this work that it was formed in uh, Asia Minor uh, in the uh, between 476 and 477. And uh, when you look at the at this at the title page of the Armenian version, because we have three versions of this: Armenian, Arabic, and uh, Syriac. The Armenian is not like them. It's different. Uh, it is more uh, adjusted to the Armenian uh, circumstances and demands. Uh, that's why we... It's not uh, very clearly uh, legible from the PowerPoint project projection, but uh, we see that it's called Oren Takavoras, Kostant Nyamosi, Theodosi, Yev Levoni. These laws were uh, compiled during the breakup of the East, uh, of the Roman Empire into Eastern and Western parts. And it was used in Asia Minor by the Syrians, by the Greeks. And these names were added there in order to give more uh, authority to these writings. Theodosios, Constantinos, Nevada. But we know that it was also codified, some of it during Levon, uh, Le Levon's time. Although this, uh, the period that it was translated was prior to the establishment of the Kingdom of Armenia, which was in uh, 1198. It was Principality at that time. We have an edition of this, uh, which was achieved in Germany uh, by Brunst and Zahal. And uh, it was around 18... Uh, 1894. And uh, later, these same laws were used by the Georgians together with the laws of Mehita Ghosh. They were incorporated into a group of laws that was called uh, Armenian laws uh, during the time of uh, the Georgian king, uh, Bahtang the Sixth, in, at, the, at the beginning of the seventh, uh, 18th century. 1710s, like that. So the, the Armenian version is unique in its uh, additions and amendations. So we find this, for example, these, uh, these canons. Canon 45 says, Now King Levon has set a law that after the blessing of the nuptials and, and the union of man and woman, if the man divorces his wife, Without any reason, he should give her all the dowries which she brought and the wedding presents as it was written in the missive, the letter, legal letter, that was inside them. And if the woman leaves her husband without a cause, the law rightly judges that she leaves without dowries and by law this will be, this will be left with the man. Another law says, the guardian who was set over the orphans, who are children, has the power to demand payment for alimentation when they reach adulthood. But he should not ask from the inheritance that they have. And these shall the guardian say to the judge and demand by his own right when they attain adulthood and not without priorly declaring it to the judge. And uh, so, oh, sorry, it's so uh, reverting back to their set Amro Nazi. Uh, he had we we are not quite sure if he had uh, a definitely hand in the translation. We assume that he did of two, these two important work by Seth Ephraim, Abedarani Tarkmanutyun, Tarkmanutyun, which is commentary, 
and the hymns on Nicomedia, which survived only in Armenian, this hymn. It's lost in Syriac. Uh, part of this uncertainty uh, lies in the fact, it arises from the fact that uh, these words, the manuscript that reach us, uh, some of them have colophons clearly stating who did the translations or who did order them, and some of them, uh, their colophons are lost, or they don't have colophon. So we are left in the dark in some places to decide uh, which uh, scholar did uh, which translation. So these are these two last are one of these cases, and uh, I would like to note about uh, Nerses Lamburanasi without forgetting that that's very important that he came from a very rich family, noble family. Maybe you know the story that when he was born, uh, his name was Sambat, uh, his uh, preordination name, and uh, his parents uh, before he was born. So his uh, mother didn't conceive for many years. When she did, uh, when she uh, before the, she made a vow to give him uh, to a monastery to make him monk. But when he was born, and they say uh, they saw his complexion, his uh, physical appearance, uh, as the picture displays, he was very handsome. So he also they said, oh, you no. Know, it's better for him to stay uh, uh, layman. Get him, let him get married. He'll be a prince, uh, not, not, not a monk. Um, uh, because they didn't. So the story says because they didn't fulfill their vow, the child became very ill and was almost going to die. So they, they renewed their vow, and he was healed. When he grew up, at a young age, he became a monk, became a priest, and uh, it, he was 24, 25 that he wrote his most famous work. It's a commentary on uh, the Divine Liturgy, which is translated in many languages, European. Uh, that's his most famous work. Uh, he has many words, among them that I like most is the Athena Anutyum, Chara, uh, he says during a council, uh, gathered uh, by representative, representatives of different churches in Tarso, Syriac, Armenian, Greeks and others, about speaking about church unity. So in a sense, he with Nerses Shonorali are the like forerunners of church unity and uh, Brotherhood, uh, amical ecclesiastical relations between different uh, churches. And he paid actually uh, 30,000 gold pounds from his own expense, 30,000 gold pounds, in order to renovate churches, to build new ones, to copy manuscripts or to renovate manuscripts. And the uh, oldest and the best preserved manuscript of uh, Greek or Narigat is Matyam Vohtepudyum, which dates from 1173, is commissioned by him. And he himself also copied manuscripts. We have evidence of that. Uh, so he has a very uh, large share in Armenian uh, literary tradition and culture. So, uh, so we come to the, uh, he's the last figure. Uh, of the uh, important uh, scholars and contributors uh, that we are talking about today. Vartan uh, Arevetti. Unfortunately, I didn't find any Uh, manuscript uh, illustration of him. Uh, so you can exercise your imagination uh, to figure him out, uh, how, how did he look out. Um, he was one of the most learned uh, figures of his time, uh, theologian, 
historian, diplomat. Um, not only in the royal court, but also with the Mongols. So, uh, he had to travel uh, to the Mongol uh, uh, court in order to negotiate a treaty whereby the churches are being lifted up from uh, heavy taxation. So, uh, we come to the, one of the most important works that, is being, that, that, that was uh, achieved during this period, and that's the translation of Michael the Syrian's Chronicle. This is the longest and the most extensive chronicle that, you, that was uh, done in, during the Middle Ages. You cannot find anything like that, neither in the, uh, neither in the West nor in the East. So, um, I, I have the Syriac, it's like uh, the one that was published by, uh, by Chabot, Jean-Baptiste Chabot, the French uh, scholar, in, from 1894 to 1921, in four big volumes. So, the, the one volume, which is a huge size, has like three, four columns, depends on the text, about, uh, it's about 800 pages, um, and the other three uh, volumes are, have the French translation. So, uh, the Armenian one that we have now uh, is, all, is like, uh, roughly like one-fifth of that work. This work is a very important source uh, for the history from the rise of Islam uh, to the Crusades. So anyone who is writing about the rise of Islam and the period following until the time of the Crusader movement so has to use this uh, source. It's a very uh, invaluable source for study uh, of this period. And it also preserves uh, sources, writings of many uh, historians that have been lost. So he says that, oh, this historian says like this, and then he comments on it. We don't find that the, the writing of that historian is lost. So his work is also of a primary source of trying to reconstruct the works of the other historians. And this work uh, was used, actually, uh, consulted by NASA, NASA, uh, the uh, Space Exploration Agency, uh, because they want uh, for their efforts to study the pattern of uh, climate changes. Because in this work we find uh, information about uh, changes that happened uh, on the planet of the Earth, uh, primarily during two uh, important periods. It's in the 6th and 7th century, because of the eruption of uh, earthquakes. At the other part of the world, at the, uh, um, at the Western Hemisphere. So it's a very important source uh, for uh, uh, study, uh, not only history, but also of climate. Uh, the Armenian is roughly one-fifth the translation. Um, and it was done actually with the help of a scholar named Ishoch, Armenian uh, name is, is the Ishoch. That's how he's named among the Armenians. So the Syriacs would have definitely called him uh, Yeshu or Yeshu, Jesus. Um, and uh, he was a, a, a doctor from Medigene, 
And that's what uh, he was a physician. That's what Bar Hebraeus, the famous uh, uh, Syriac writer, relates to us. Um, he is also known as uh, Ishuaf Hassan Kaif. Well, maybe it's a city near Melitene, that's where it came from. And uh, he moved to Cilicia at an uh, early date, uh, serving the king as a physician. Uh, we know also from uh, a church that was built in uh, Cis, dedicated to the Saint Barsoma, the saint that we talked about, uh, that it was uh, built by him. And uh, the same writer says that when the uh, when Cis was burned by the Mandus, only this church miraculously survived a destruction. Uh, in uh, 1249. Uh, this work was done in the... Uh, this translation was done in the castle of Rongla, uh, which was a very... Uh, impregnable castle. That's why it was used also as a castle uh, before these areas fell into the hands of the uh, Seljuks, the Turks, and then the Catholic said had to move to Cis. And uh, in this collaboration uh, between uh, Isho and uh, Vartan Arevetsi, uh, we find the good uh, example of a collaboration between these two scholars when when we look at this work we can see that it's not a simple translation uh, Vartan Areverti omitted many parts in it, that's why he got a reduced uh, volume he uh, left these parts where it was important for the Armenians, it dealt with the Armenians, with the Syriacs, and uh, also with these events that dealt primarily with the, with the main events of the period. He reorganized them, re-edited it. Uh, when you look closely at the uh, structure of the original Syriac and the Armenian, they differ greatly. So it's not a translation, or it's not a abridgment. It's like a reworking, it's, a, it's like a new work. So Vartan Arevetti has a big contribution in it, and he also added some parts in it, on it that were missing from uh, uh, this work, uh, particularly these parts uh, relating to the Crusades and Armenian relations, because as we know, uh, Ephraim, uh, sorry, Michael the Great died in 1199, so he finished his book long before that. And uh, we know that Vartan Arevetti did his uh, translation in 1246, 1248. 1248 is the more acceptable date for this translation. But uh, during, for the period, the gap period, he had to add uh, important uh, information from him, from his own observation that belong to that period. So it's, a, it's not a, just a translation, it's a, also a work uh, of creation, the creative work. And this was done uh, by the order of Catholicos Constantin Parzerberci, actually. Uh, he ordered that in the Catholicos residence itself, in Rome. So they came and they worked there. And the autograph, actually interesting, is that the manuscript for this, uh, where they based their translation, where they translated from, was the one autographed, written by Michael the Great, or Michael the Syrian himself. So, 
Their patriarch, one of his successors, successors Ignatius II, he graciously gave this copy to them to work on it. Which is astonishing because the oldest manuscript and the only one, the Syriac one, that we have for this work, dates from 1589. And it was discovered only uh, in the last decades of the 19th century in Aleppo. The scholar, Chapo, who uh, arranged these manuscripts to be copied. Someone copied it completely. So the one that we have here, he published, is the one written in hand again. It's not typeset. He couldn't bring that from Aleppo outside. It's still in Aleppo. It's covered in a box in a church, in Aleppo, Syrian church. And uh, somehow, somehow a person managed uh, headed by uh, the founder of uh, Gordias uh, Press here uh, in, uh, in the United States, a Syrian. He managed a group of scholars to, uh, to make a maximal edition of this work and have the Armenian translation with it. That this was recently done. Um, and also the Arabic translation. Uh, and so until the end of the uh, 19th century, this work was, also, was not only from Armenian. It was translated into French in, in 1867 by Victor Langlois, the French Orientalist, and uh, published in Paris. Uh, and the Armenians knew about this, uh, the world knew about this, uh, this book only, this work only from the Armenian translation. Uh, there are some, uh, the Syrian uh, text has some textual issues in some places. It can be corrected through the help of the Armenian, but scholars has to, have to be very cautious about it. So I would like to... Uh, uh, read uh, some excerpts from this. Uh, so, yes. Uh, so, uh, uh, Michael the Great, we know this information from his work only. Uh, this is also reflected in the Armenian translation, because it's important. He talks about uh, how uh, Toros escaped from the prison, and came regained his land, as an ancestral land. He says, as I have already shown, Levon the Armenian was captured by Ioannes, king of the Greeks, and took him to Constantinople. I did this translation from the Syriac, especially for this. And part of the land of Sinesia remained with Greek, and part of it in the hands of the Turks. That when King Ioannes died, Levon himself died too. In Constantinople, one of the sons of Levon, whose name was Poros, escaped and went out. And since he did not possess anything, somehow on foot and secretly reached to Mar Athanasius, the metropolitan of the land, because he had trust in the elder from the days of his father. So he had acquaintance with him and his father too, Mar Athanasius, the metropolitan. And for this reason, he asked from him to pray to God that he return the land of his fathers to him. He, the saintly bishop, with tears, bestowed gifts or blessings. It depends how we understand the Syriacs, because the same word means gifts and blessings. To him, and gave him the price of a horse. And when he procured a mount, a horse, twelve men joined him. Uh, the Armenian version says that uh, to him, uh, that the Metropolitan gave him his own horse and 12 of his disciples and went to the fortress called Amuda. When its inhabitants perceived that the son of their master came, they seized the Greeks who were in it and handed the fortress over to Toros. And when the news of it spread, his fear fell on the Greeks and on the Turks and gradually he ruled many places and many people from among the Armenians and from the friends gathered around him. Uh, 
So in order to, in order to spare you time, I am omitting the other passage. Uh, so I am going to the last part. Uh, these are also the other uh, parts of the these are the translations that he did. Uh, not with Ishok, but with himself or with other, by himself or by, with other uh, Sidak scholars. Uh, like the profession of faith and under order of priesthood, these works are always attached to the work of uh, Michael the Syrian's Chronicle. So in the manuscripts, they always together. You, you rarely find the manuscripts, maybe uh, among the 40 or more, she wants that you find this the chronicle alone. So they are always together in the manuscripts. Uh, and uh, Jacob of Sarut's uh, uh, Memras, Char, and Tatios uh, Yevapkar, King Abgar, Afedesa. Uh, so he had uh, for his uh, collaboration, Simeon. Simon, uh, the, the Syriac, uh, for this last two, while for the others he had Ishu or Ishu, uh, the priest, uh, uh, the physician. He was also a priest. So this is a uh, an Armenian edition of the uh, chronicle uh, that uh, appeared in uh, Jerusalem. Uh, there are two versions of that of this work. So this is the, uh, one of them from 1870. The other is from 1871. They don't differ much, but they seem to have uh, happened to have two versions lately uh, in the sub subsequent uh, centuries. So it's the uh, history uh, uh, of the world from the creation up to the time of Michael the Great. So we come to a very important uh, chapter in the, this cultural exchange of uh, Syriacs and uh, Armenians uh, relating to the uh, medical uh, uh, treatises. So, uh, We know that uh, apart from uh, these three works listed by Faraj, Abu Said, and Ishok, the same person that we are talking about, we have uh, other works translated during or uh, during these centuries, uh, not not only from Syriac but also from Arabic. Uh, these are the works that were translated from Syriac, we know for sure, or maybe from intermediary Arabic through a uh, Syriac scholar. Uh, we know that in the Cilician Armenia there was special care was taken uh, by kings uh, to, uh, to, to uh, translate uh, practical manuals uh, on different areas of, uh, of industry. Uh, for example, we know that uh, King Hetum uh, who had a long reign from 1221-1270, he commissioned the transition of Arabic works uh, related to steel production, steel. We know that swords made of steel. So it's very important to have uh, good steel production in order to have a good uh, armament, as a consequence, in order to have a good army and good uh, uh, defense of the land. Uh, horse care, they are, they are very important uh, aspect. Uh, and uh, uh, also uh, sword, sword manufacturing, practical manuals and sword manufacturing. And astrology uh, for, uh, for travelers, for uh, fishermen. Uh, we are we are quite sure that uh, the Syriacs they had hands in the translation uh, of these works from uh, Arabic uh, into Armenian uh, because they had been so for the Arabs they helped Arabs to translate the 
Greek words from Arabic, uh, from uh, Greek into Arabic. So uh, with Farage, we see Bush Garanzio, Yevara Sarak Rasto, Manuel for the care of horses and pack animals, uh, which was uh, very important given that uh, uh, the horses uh, were a, and the pack animals were the main means of uh, travel and uh, transfer, transport at that time. Uh, this was written during the uh, short reign of uh, King Sinbad, uh, the third of Cilicia, uh, who reigned during uh, the last uh, few years of uh, 13th century, 1296 uh, 1299. Um, yes, he, did, he used Arabic sources for this. Uh, the Faraj. Arabic sources of this, and then Armenian uh, man called Poros, he helped him smooth the translation. Uh, we next come to uh, Abu Said on the constitution of man. It's an anatom anatomical work. Uh, uh, this man, so it sounds Arabic name, but he was Syrian. Uh, he was a deacon, and we know about him uh, that he was prob probably from Urha. He was captured by the Turks uh, um, in 1138 when he tried uh, near, near Samusat, near the city, when he tried to take uh, relief uh, help to Urha that was besieged by the Turks. When he uh, was released from captivity, he went to Cilicia and uh, he, uh, he, he settled there and provided uh, uh, help in uh, compiling these uh, important uh, medical treaties. Uh, the last uh, item in this lecture too is the, uh, is the work of Ishoch, which is called Kit Kivera Bhutyan Hanur Yem Masnagan. It's a it's called book on nature. It's work on, on physics or natural philosophy, as it was called then. Um, anatomy, meteorology, uh, properties of minerals, uh, and uh, there are also theoretical insights in this book. Uh, we know that in 1241, Queen Zabel founded a hospital in uh, in Cis. She found the hospital in 1241. Uh, we can assume, uh, quite on uh, fairly logical grounds, that uh, at about this time, uh, Ishoch came from Meditene to assist in order to uh, render his service in this hospital. Uh, and uh, because he was a court physician, he was also given uh, the permission to build a church dedicated to Mar Bar Sauma in Cis itself. Uh, also, we know that he collaborated with Michael, the, uh, with Vardan uh, Arivetsi, sorry, for the uh, translation of Michael the Great's work uh, into Armenian. So, uh, uh, it is interesting. Let me read you an excerpt from his work. Uh, in the following description of force and motion in nature, Ishoch employs the same analogy as is later found in the manuscripts of Leonardo da Vinci, where he resembles nature to harp, while with El Ishoch with him it is to lie. lie. He says, and nature became like soul, and the elements like materials and the ones composed of similar parts as instruments, and animals and plants and the minerals as works. And an example of them is the lyre, which is composed of wood and wire and of hands, which moves it, and is known from its sound that it works. Likewise also nature moves the sphere of heavens, and it moves the time, and the time moves the elements. And they move the animals and the plants, and the useful fossils. And with these motions everything was kept 
and honor in its own position. So we come uh, almost to the end. Uh, this is the edition, uh, the opening page of the Book of Nature, uh, achieved in Yerevan in uh, 1979 by Stella Vardanian. She is an expert in Armenian medieval uh, medical texts. And uh, this is one of her words, among many others she has in this area. Uh, as you see, it's a critical text uh, with the variant readings in the notes below. And uh, partly speaking about my work on Maruta, uh, this is one of the manuscripts that I have used um, until when I recently finished my doctoral thesis and I already submitted it to my uh, doctoral supervisor in Louvain. Uh, this is one of the uh, uh, homilies written by uh, uh, Maruta Aftagrit uh, from uh, 1419. It's uh, found in a jarantir uh, that was copied in Jerusalem in 1419. And uh, there are uh, reasonable grounds to believe that uh, Vartan Areverti was, uh, was the scholar who uh, helped translate his work from uh, Syriac into Armenian. Uh, I believe so that it's a production of the Sedition period. And uh, this is another uh, uh, manuscript of uh, tentatively dated to 14th century. So, um, one of the in, one of the reasons behind the uh, cultural transmissions from this period from the Syriacs to Armenians is that uh, because uh, the Mongols invaded and uh, destroyed Baghdad in 1258. Uh, learning and uh, literature in the East begin, began to fade into uh, posterity. So, the reason that we see that uh, the Syriacs were very adamant to hand over the, their heritage and culture to the Armenians through translations is that they were sensing that Almost they were uh, in an eclipse, uh, knowledge-wise and uh, cultural-wise. Uh, because after uh, Bar Hebraeus, who was the, who is considered who is considered the greatest, the latest, the biggest figure in the Syriac culture, uh, literature and uh, theology and philosophy, and also historiography, we don't find uh, any more important figures after him. He died in uh, 1286 in Marara, actually, and uh, in Ma Nahichevan, Marara, Nahichevan. Uh, and that's why we see the Syriacs, contrary to the 5th century when the Armenians used to go to Edessa, to the Syrians, to accept, to get knowledge from them, now is the Syrians are the ones who come to the Armenians, offering them their help, uh, uh, their expertise and their knowledge. Um, and uh, uh, Bar Hebraeus is the uh, uh, last figure in that, uh, in that uh, movement, of uh, uh, Syria cultural movement, where uh, we can see that it's, it's like an epilogue to the Syriac uh, culture of his day. Uh, it's, uh, it's in the uh, cathedral uh, church of Sis where this uh, personality uh, known 
uh, as the Gregory uh, Abu Faraj, uh, but more widely is known as Bar Hebraeus, son of the Hebrew. Uh, he was born in Malatya. His father was a Jew. That's why they used to call him son of the Jew. His father's name was Aaron, Harun, Bar Hebraeus, son of the Jew. That's what he's known uh, as. Uh, and he has a very, very uh, wide uh, uh, writings of uh, diverse uh, uh, topics, uh, philosophy, theology, uh, History, both secular and uh, church, ecclesiastic, logic. Uh, and uh, he was a man of encyclopedic knowledge, truly encyclopedic knowledge. Maybe Vartan Arevelti among the Armenians uh, was like him. And in 1264, he was, uh, or he was uh, enthroned as a Maprian. Maprian is like the Catholicus in the Assyrian church. Uh, below the patriarch. He's like head of bishops, ranking below the high patriarch. And uh, he says this, this is the last uh, paragraph I was, I'm going to read to you before I conclude this uh, lecture. He says, when the Alpine, he, spe he speaks about himself, uh, Gregory Abu uh, Faraj Bar Hebraeus, because he worked in Aleppo sometimes. Went to Cilicia, he found the faithful people in uproar for the following reason. As soon as Theodorus arrived at the monastery, he sent the priest Bunir and the monk Theodorus Smakraya, which means red hair, ruddy, red head, who was from Cis, and through them promised the king of Cilicia and his nobles a son, like a bribe, to make him Catholicus over the Syrians. This Theodor Barbahapu we are talking about so that they go to the bishops gathered in Cilicia to make him a patriarch. He even enticed and brought to him the old bishop of Claudia. He continues, uh, Gregory of Aleppo, him, joined the, uh, joined the bishops of Cilicia. When he saw that the people is zealous in virtue and the detesting of treachery, they confirmed the election and proclaimed and proclamation of Rabban Ishu, head of the monastery of Kavikat. A chaste and failed man, loved by the king and his nobles, and they ordained him on the day of the Feast of Epiphany, in the year 1264, in the same monastery, and he was called my Ignatius. This is the other patriarch that I was talking about. Uh, so, uh, and after the consecration of the patriarch was concluded, the patriarch and the bishops took care also to set a mafia for the East, which for a long time was deprived of a shepherd. And since they knew that long ago the late Marmaladani chose Gregorius of Aleppo to become a mafia, it's about him, himself, he also informed the Easterners about him. And in his many letters, he called him the chosen one of the East. He received their common consent, but by reason of the turmoil caused by the Mongols, Mongol forces in Assyria, his mission was delayed. So he, he, he was supposed to go to the east, but he couldn't because of the Mongol uh, invasions. They did not change the appointing, but to him alone they entrusted the superintendents of the east. And the patriarch came with bishops to seize. Uh, actually, this is from his Syriac work, which is called uh, Ecclesiastical Chronicle. I did this translation especially for this lecture to English. When also present King Hatton in Cis, his sons and his nobles, some bishops and Armenian doctors, Bartabets, and the, and the multitude of people in the Catholic Church of Mother of God, which is the Sub Aswadi Church in Cis. And Gregorius was proclaimed the Mafrian of the East. And in that day, the Maprian delivered the homily, that's about him, on the high priesthood, from the following words of the Psalms verse, you have created me and laid your hand upon me. While Theodoros Smakraya, which, which means red-haired in Syriac, curious, uh, you know, epithet, last name, translated it into Armenian, 
interesting Syriac scholar who translated to Armenian at the same time. Indeed, that day was a celebrated day. Thank you. That was all. Thank you.